So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay, so here we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit of the history of the Arabic language. And we're going to be talking about Taha Hussein. So, when it comes to the history of Arabic, so imagine this is the Arabian Peninsula. We start off with Arabian Peninsula. So, this isn't the best map in the world, but I'm sure, inshallah, you guys can forgive me for... So, okay, so this is, imagine this to be the Arabian Peninsula what we see as Saudi Arabia today. So the history of the Arabs is like this. There used to be a group of original indigenous Arabs that used to live here. Okay, and the Arabs that used to live here, they were, the Quran mentions about some of them, Samud and Ad, they used to live around this area. Okay, these were like the original, or some of the original ones that used to live. These were known as the Ba'idah. Ba'idah means that these people, there's no mention of them anymore. Yeah, they were destroyed or they uh, no longer remained and then you had other arabs around this area as well yeah so you had other arabs living around this area these were known as the arab baqiya the remaining arabs okay the remaining ones um original arabs that you have these are known as the these are known what, what they call the qahtani arabs qahtan the qahtani arabs and then you have the arabs that were introduced into islam sorry People that were introduced into being Arab, they were known as the Adananiyun. They came from Yemen and they were known as the Adananiyun. Or they they affiliated to Yemen. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, he joined them. So Ismail alayhi salam originally was not an Arab. So he is known as the Arab Musta'araba. Musta'araba. So Qahtan were the original Arabs. And the Musta'araba ones that were the ones that were introduced into the Arab community. And then in the Arab Arabian Peninsula, you had other communities who, which were non-Arab communities as well. So you had people like the the Jews that had been living here. You had Christians and others. And they didn't... The Christians, although they were predominantly in the south, yeah, they were in the south, Jews were scattered in various places. So the Christians, because of... Um, Africa, the Africans, the Christians there, they supported them and uh, and that's that's the kind of layout of the of the time. Now slowly as what started to happen was the Arabic language began to develop. So they don't know exactly how the Arabic language developed. Like they don't know the exact details of it. But what they do know is that the Arabs around the Arabian Peninsula they differed in several things. So they differed in the language Meaning their language was not absolutely different, but their language had different dialects. Yeah, so the dialects, certain words as well that one tribe would use, were different from what another tribe would use. Um, you had writing as well. So some of the writing that was found was quite different as well. Yeah, so the writing that we're used to that was one form of writing. There was also other forms of writing at that time as well. Yeah, so so this is why the Arabs at that time. Yeah, they they did differ. That's without a doubt they did differ. Um, and the other thing obviously was that some of the Arabs were influenced were influenced by the Romans to the north. Some of the Arabs were influenced by the Persians yeah, to the east. Right. So you had various different types of Arab inclinations as well. Some Arabs that were inclined towards the Romans' way of life. Some Arabs that were inclined towards the Persian way of life. So you had certain things that were introduced from Persia into the Arabian society and you had some things that were introduced from the Romans into the Arabian society as well. Okay, so you had the the coins, the dirham and the dinar that was introduced from outside. It was from the Romans. Yeah, so they introduced it there and so forth. So we, have, we, we acknowledge this, that this was there. And we also know that the Arabic language itself, Arabic language, it consists of foreign words as well. Yeah, like for example, the word Firdos, originally this word Firdos, it's a Persian word. Yeah, and the English word paradise comes from the paradise, Firdos, it actually comes from the word Firdos. So you had these words that were there. Now what happened was, as time was going by, yeah, the Arabic language was slowly kind of changing 
it was changing according to the times so imagine like you know you had uh, let's say the emergence of islam was here okay emergence of islam in the in the in, in the sixth century or was it seventh century yeah so there it was there and then slowly what was happening was as time was going by arabic was being influenced the arabs were being influenced by different things it's being shaped now one of the things the arabs had was they had the reverence of the kaaba so the kaaba which is situated there the kaaba was something that they held high in their community okay they held that very high they had lots of respect for the kaaba now this Kaaba, according to the, what the Quran tells us, this Kaaba was built by Ibrahim and Ismail. Yeah, that's the Kaaba that was built by him. And the Quran mentions this in many verses. And the Arabs, because of that, they affiliated themselves to the tradition of Ibrahim. Okay, so now what you're starting to get is Arabs who hold fast to certain old traditions of Ibrahim. Right? So the problem with this tradition is, is that some of the things we can say are valid. For example, they believe there was something known as the Hajj. They believe that there was the, um, you know, uh, pilgrims, honoring the pilgrims, etc. But some of the things they were made up. So, for example, like burying the daughter alive to claim that the angels were the daughters of God, to claim that they were idols that they could worship, etc. This had no, <clears throat> this had no. Uh, truth behind it there was no reality to this this was all made up so as time went by their their faith became twisted and this is why the Arabs faith was not all one they didn't have one ideology by which they would lead their lives no they had various things so for example like you had some Arabs who believed in one God yeah that's we know that from many of the verses of the Quran and we know that from a hadith as well where the Prophet Sallallahu talked about certain individuals who were Muwahids but majority of them were not and then you had some who believed in angels some who didn't some who were believed in the hereafter some who didn't some who believed in other forms of so the Arabs in their beliefs they weren't all unified so they were scattered in what they used to believe as well so it wasn't fixed so you had that problem there, the Arabs. And another issue that the Arabs had was that the Arabs' politics was very different. So in Jahiliya, Jahiliya is considered the time before the emergence of Islam. So say Islam appeared in the 6th century. So all of this was known as Jahiliya, which means the era of ignorance. They didn't know, yeah, the era in which they didn't know. Okay, so the politics in this time was very different you know the politics in Yemen was different how they used to run things the politics in Mecca was different the way they used to run things the politics in the north was different so the way they used to run things I don't want to go into details of that but each tribe each society had a kind of tailor-made system for their society and certain rules they used to share with other tribes and certain rules they didn't. Yes, they did had, have some common rules which were widespread over the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah, like for example, the four holy months. So the four holy months that was common. They used to respect that. The Kaaba, they obviously respected that. Um, so these were kind of certain things that... But besides that, certain tribes, certain cities shared different things. Okay, so now what we have to understand is that look when the Quran was revealed at this moment right at this moment there was a certain language the Quran was revealed in it wasn't not revealed in every dialect of the Arabian Peninsula it was revealed in the language of Quraysh yeah so the people around the Kaaba were known as the people of Quraysh and Quraysh is simply a tribe name yeah a tribe name or where the Prophet Sallallahu belongs to as well so this was um uh, you know, from yeah, so they used to have family trees. So the Prophet Sallallahu he belonged to one tribe. So this umbrella tribe was known as Quraysh. Okay, Quraysh was known as Quraysh. So there were many different people that used to come under Quraysh. Yeah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came under Quraysh. Abu Bakr Siddiq came under Quraysh. Umar Radiallahu came under Quraysh. Uthman came under Quraysh. Ali Radiallahu came under Quraysh. Many of the other Sahaba in Mecca came under Quraysh. So Quraysh was an umbrella was an umbrella name 
for many many different tribes and sub tribes okay so quraysh were the people who were li living in mecca at that time and so the quran was revealed in their tongue in their language and the themes of the, however the quran even though it was revealed in the language of the quraysh the arabic of the quran was like an arabic that was understood by everyone you know sometimes you have like in one country like in england for instance if you go to one city in a different city you'll see them speaking in a different way their dialects their accents this type of words that they use but when it comes to like the formal language everyone generally understands what the formal lang the language of the media is the language of the news on tv is they understand that so you can understand in a similar way when the quran was revealed it was revealed in a language where everyone could understand what the quran was saying okay so <clears throat> this was this was the introduction of the the arabic language into or the quran rather into the arabian society and the quran began to refute certain things the quran began to point out mistakes in their community the quran began to clarify certain problems that they had okay and you know that's how islam began to uh, emerge and and find itself in their society now that's how we understand that's how we understand all of this now in the last century there was a man by the name of taha hussein taha hussein was an egyptian he died in the 70s so in the 70s he passed away okay so it wasn't it wasn't that far away and what happened was taha hussein actually he started a new movement this was the first time in the history of the Muslims where such a movement took off I mean it's there have been people in history who have said certain things but it's just it hasn't really picked up it hasn't been accepted so Taha Hussein started off with this movement now before I explain this movement what I need to explain to you is one thing about how the Arabic language we have today how it's been preserved so what we believe is that the Arabic language from when the Quran, so let's say for example the Quran is revealed here. Arabic was spoken before the Quran. Okay, so and let's say we over here. It's us there. So what happened was this is that we believe that the Quran is in Arabic. And how do we know that the Arabic in the Quran is the Arabic that we understand? So let's say for example we open a page of the Quran, yeah, and we let's say come across the word, I don't know, um, Khatam. Khatama means to seal. How do we know that the word khatama in the Quran means to seal? Yeah, we take it for granted that khatama means to seal because dictionaries. So what we have to understand is we need to know the Arabic which was at the time when the Quran was being revealed. So this era, this era, especially the 23 years of the life of the Prophet ﷺ when the Quran is being revealed, we need to know the Arabic language at that time. Because Arabic has been changing over the years. It's it's a natural language, a human language, and human language languages go through changes. So this era, the Arabic language, we believe that this language has been preserved. And the way it was preserved was Allah Himself has promised that the Quran is going to be preserved. And if Allah promises the Quran will be preserved, then that means everything to do with the Arabic language is preserved. And this is why the Quran the pronunciation of the letters has been preserved Qira'at, the rules of tajweed all of these things have been preserved until today we can you know retrace all of our tajweed back to you know early scholars sahaba the uh, tafsir of many of the verses has been preserved through continuous chains we have uh, dictionaries that the scholars developed we have um, also historic historic events that have been recorded as well and so forth okay so these things have been recorded and we know that this has been recorded till today to a very detailed and strong level now the question is that before this how do we know that the words meant that so the language of the Arabic the language the language itself this language we believe has been preserved through poetry and other literature poetry and literature have been used as two means or two conveyors which have carried the arabic language over the centuries and poetry itself it was something that existed even before islam 
people used to use poetry as a means of expressing themselves, as a means of politics for, you know, political issues, for warfare, for ro romance, for just, you know, entertainment, all sorts of things poetry was used for. So this is why we find poetry widespread throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Poetry has been widespread. And what used to happen was some people used to say poetry and that poetry got lost. Okay, So some of the poetry in history, we've lost it yeah, because it wasn't preserved. But some of the poetry, on the other hand, is preserved. And the method of preservation of poetry is a method which is not, you have to understand this, it's not the same as hadith. Hadith literature has a very strict uh, have very strict principles by which we accept and we don't accept hadith. So we don't use the same principles for preserving hadith. Okay. And the other thing about about preserving poetry, poetry follows certain patterns as well. It follows certain rhythms and patterns. So these rhythms and these patterns are known as the meters of poetry, okay? the meters, the poetic meters that poems follow. So these poetic meters, just like mu musical you know, uh, notes, if you have music and that music, you know, you've heard this music so many times and something changes slightly in there, you can tell straight away that this doesn't fit, this note doesn't fit in this place. So the Arabs, their poetry was natural to them. So when they used to say poetry, it used to follow certain meters as well, patterns. So that was that. And likewise, we had Sahaba at the time this era who, who were experts in their language and they knew all the nuances of the language as well generally they generally knew all the nuances some of them were possibly unaware but that was the case and because the Arabs were not influenced greatly by foreign foreigners compared to Byzantine compared to Persia Arabs were secluded they were isolated from the outside world relatively so that's why their language remained preserved amongst themselves. Now, poets before Islam, let's say for example, this is a poet. When he used to say his poetry, there were various ways by which he used to convey his poetry. So one was he would say it to his people. Another way was that he would, when they used to go for Hajj, so like I told you about Hajj, they used to really believe the Kaaba was holy. So they would go there and they would say their poetry there or some say they used to hang their poetry. They used to hang their poetry there and it was like a, an international festival. So you imagine, you know, something like we have at the NEC or you have a convention, international convention center and people come there and then you have the opportunity to, you know, present your ideas or, you know, your poetry and you say your poetry and people hear it and they, and you have to understand that the Arabs in them times had extremely amazing memories. So their memory was fantastic. Yeah, they were able to memorize things the first time they heard it. That was just some natural thing that came to them. Maybe it's because of the environment, some say, desert environment, they've got nothing else to do. And just like today, you see, if you go to desert dwellers, you'll find that their they, they, uh, memory is very acute, very, very strong. So memory-wise, these people were at another level, like they say. So that was another way. And a third way was they used to have a personal a personal student or what they call a narrator who's known as a rawi maybe some used to have one some used to have multiple who used to you can imagine them like the apprentice yeah someone who's shadows someone stays in their company and learns from them and and perfects and in the olden days apprenticeship was one of the ways through which people used to um you know do that kind of stuff so they used to have that so this is how poetry was passed down generation 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 okay and 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 it, and it came all the way down there now what happened was when islam came because the whole of the dynamics of of the world or the arabian peninsula began to change there were wars there were confrontations so what happened was the muslims were not really preserving the poetry as they used to it was still being preserved by other people around yeah don't get me wrong muslims were preserved but not as they used to before and then it was only after islam where umar radiallahu anhu he came and then umar radiallahu anhu he thought you know what guys we gotta uh, you know 
So Umar radiallahu anhu came and said, you know what guys, we got to sort something out now. Because we got to preserve the Quran. And the only way to preserve the Quran is by trying to collect our poetry, our heritage that we have in literature. So he was very particular about poetry. He used to love poetry. The Prophet sallallahu used to love poetry as well, especially po po poets like um, uh, Ibn Abi Salt, Umayyah Ibn Abi Salt. Yeah. So this was a guy the Prophet sallallahu used to love. And sometimes he used to tell some of the Sahaba, read some poetry to me. And he would listen to it because Umayyah Ibn Abi Salt was a Christian and he used to talk a lot about oneness of God and he used to talk a lot about um, you know, morals and ethics and being a good person and staying away from doing bad. So even before Islam came, you had people in society that were like this. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he encouraged people to preserve their language. And in the Banu Umayyad period, you know, poetry started to take off again. So this was the Banu Umayyad period. post However, however, one thing you have to remember about Arabs is this, is Arabs had... In the time of Jahiliyyah, the Arabs were very uh, pri proud people. They were proud of their lineage, they were proud of their, their status, they were proud of themselves. And this led to them showing signs of ego and showing racism as well. Yeah. So these were two problems that unfortunately were embedded in the Arabs. And it can be seen in a lot of their poetry as well, when they used to boast about themselves and show off so when islam came islam got rid of all this or it culled it yeah, it reduced it to a, a very uh you know significant level however when the prophet ﷺ passed away and when the muslims um continued what happened was in the umayyad period this you know lineage and this rivalry and ego and racism began to develop again so this can be seen in their poems again now yeah this kind of thing and unfortunately, you know, people began to invent poetry, yeah, just invent it. In other words, they used to um, plagiarize other people's poems and add their own additions to it. And they used to, you know, change things. So there was this problem, yes, we do accept. But, you know, Alhamdulillah, our, our language is being preserved. There were experts in the world that could sift through these things and they could find the right meanings. And that's when scholars began to devise dictionaries. So the Muslims were the first people in history who have devised detailed dictionaries like we have. Yeah, so they because they knew the Quran had to be preserved. And the the Muslim dictionary, if you read one of the early dictionaries, it's not like our dictionary we have today. The dictionaries in the olden days were I mean, if you guys some of you guys have done the 17 lessons with me and you know you've seen how we deal with the dictionaries, then it was like if you had a word, let's say you had the word khatama the author would actually go through all the usages of khatama yeah all the use of khatama what the scholars have said about khatama and how it has been used and here and difference of opinions of how khatama has been used so it's like a for each word they write like an essay yeah, for each word an essay is written so you can imagine that how, what kind of dictionaries they had in them this yeah, it was a very detailed dictionary and you can still access these dictionaries you can get a hold of these dictionaries even till today right so the muslims had this tradition of you know what we need to preserve our language and we need to be balanced about the meanings of the words and you know we can't but we, like nowadays a lot of the dictionaries it's like they'll give you a word and they'll just say right khatama means sealed end of story and it's like you think to yourself that that's the absolute meaning of khatama and there's no other meaning khatama can take right but that's not how the arabic dictionaries were so this is i thought i'd mention to you guys a bit about the history of how arabic developed over the years now Taha Hussein, what did he, what has he done? So Taha Hussein, he was living in Egypt, born and brought up in Egypt. Um, originally from, uh, from, from outside, he's from, I think it was from Kurd. Uh, but the thing was, what he done was, he went to Paris. And when he went to Paris, he studied, you know, philosophy. And, and he, he was exposed to a lot of uh, new age thinking as well. And what he thought he'd do, is he wanted to revise the whole of the history of the Arabic language according to the philosophy of the West. Yeah, so like, you know, Descartes' philosophy, which is, right, he decided that what I'm going to do now is I'm going to separate separate myself from Islam 
I want to separate myself from me being Egyptian. I want to separate myself from me knowing Arabic. And I want to look and study the Arabic history of the Arabic language from an objective point of view. Yes, yeah, so I want to be impartial, totally impartial. I don't want even want my Islamic roots to affect this. Now, sounds very sincere. But you see, the problem with that is, is <clears throat> this led to him doubting the whole of the tradition about everything. And I'll show you the kind of doubts that he came up with. So doubts that even came into the Quran as well. That's the problem. Yeah, so he even began to question things that are in the Quran. Absolute things that are mentioned in the Quran. He began to question them. So he wrote a book called Fifi Shi'r Fi Shi'r Al Jahili. And this became a, a bestseller book in at that time. And you know what's gonna happen. There's gonna be scholars who are gonna uh, refute this as well now. So many of the, the big scholars of his time they got up and they they criticized his book, they studied the whole of his book. They criticized it. They wrote many, many rebuttals on this book as well. And, you know, and alhamdulillah, you can get access to those as well. So, okay, I'm just going to mention to you a few of the things he said. I don't want to go through all the things. Yeah, that's something that maybe you guys can go through. But this was requested to me by, you know, one of the, the brothers who requested I'll go through a bit about this issue of Taha Hussein. And it's important for advanced students of Arabic language to know this. Yeah, so they know that look, this is the kind of ideas that were introduced by late scholars. So, okay. So, number one, the first thing that he says is this. He says that the problem with the reason he, he okay, let me just say what he says. He believes, this is his claim, he believes that the Arabic lit, the Arabic literature that we have is unreliable. That's ultimately what the whole book is about. Arabic literature that we have today is unreliable. In other words, if we had the word like khatama, like I told you, I'm just giving you an example, I'm not saying this is what I said. It's an example. If you had the word khatama, we can't 100% be sure that the word khatama means seal. Yeah, we can't be sure. And if that's the case, that means lots of words in the Quran, we can't be sure what they mean. And if we don't know what lots of words in the Quran mean, then to us, the only thing that's left is that is the Quran reliable for us? Are we understanding the Quran as it was revealed? Or is there doubt in dinner? So this is what the this is what ultimately his claim is leading to. So what are the reasons for this? So the reasons he he mentions, he mentions several reasons. He says, number one, he says poems, the poets did not give a, a true picture of did not give a true picture of Jahiliya. Yeah, the poets did not give a true picture of Jahiliya. In other words, the poets, they didn't give a true image of what the life in Jahiliya was like. Yeah, they gave a very false image. And that just shows you that these poets, if they're giving a false image, it means that either it means that they were lying themselves, and why would they lie about their own community? Or number two is that people that came after them have invented poems and have attributed to them. So number two, okay, what he says is this. He says, if the Arabs were so different in their dialects and their language, and he quotes some people and he says that some of the, uh, even the Muslim historians and the Oriental historians have said that the Arabic language was so different that Arabic in the South can be considered a totally different language from Arabic in the North. Yeah, so he says, if the Arabic language was so different, why are the poems following the same dialect or language? So if the poems are so different, why is poetry the same? So he says, poetry you get from the north is the same as the poetry in the south. The language is the same. It's like someone who is, you know, um, uh, from America writing literature, which is the same as someone who is speaking English from Nigeria yeah or someone from so today's term times we can understand it because communities are well connected but in them days it was difficult because their language would be different so he's saying why is the poetry so so similar for yeah if there's different dialects you should get different and then leads on from that number three why are the meters of poetry the meters the sounds that the poetry poems, the poems make why are the meters the same shouldn't they have invented their own own you know sounds and all that 
Then he says number four, he says we don't have a strong chain that goes back to each poet. So we can't 100% say that let's say for example, there's a poet in history and we have a poem that we read today. We can't 100% say that this poet in history said this poem. You can't say it. there's no strong chain for it. Um, and another is he says that uh, number how shall we hear? number five, he says that this was a lot of the poetry. Most of the poetry was invented by the Banu Umayyads, the Banu Umayya. Yeah, so the Banu Umayya were like I showed you guys. Um, where did I do it? The Banu Umayya were here. Yeah, so these guys were the ones who invented a lot of the poetry, who made it up and attributed it to the poets. Um, and likewise, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, poems that we have are poets. Oh, sorry. Um, a lot of the poems that we have have been made up by mufassirs of the Quran and muhaddithin, yeah, scholars of hadith. They've made them up. And I just one more. Okay, and that's it. Okay, the last one he says is that this is a uh, a false image. This is a false image of Arabs. What does he mean by that? Well, one of the things he means is, you know, Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam, they didn't build the Kaaba. And the question comes, well, doesn't the Quran clearly say that the Ibrahim alayhi salam? So he says, we can't take everything in the Quran literally. <clears throat> okay, so everyone got these points, yeah? So ultimately what he's basically saying at the last point is that, you know, a lot of the things in the Quran, they're not there literally. Yeah, in other words, that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, even though the Quran says it, it doesn't mean that they built it. It was just said by the Prophet He believed the Quran was said by the Prophet inspired by Allah, but it was just said by him. It's his own interpretation of revelation. And he added... No, the Prophet ﷺ ultimately added things into the Quran to make the Arabs inclined towards him. Yeah, to make the Arabs inclined towards his message. Which Naudhu Billah, Allah save us, is obviously, you know, deconstructing the whole of Sharia. Yeah, and claiming that Islam is nothing more than the uh, ideas and thoughts of the Prophet ﷺ. Yeah, inspired by Allah. That's that's all that's saying, which we don't believe at all. Yeah, and you know, may Allah forgive him for for what he said, and you know, may Allah give us understanding of our heritage as well. Okay, so now, how have scholars respond to this? Now, I've given you the whole of the introduction of the history of Arabic language. One of the reasons for this was so that we can understand the answers before the questions. So, for example, like poets did not give true image of Jahiliya. Okay, then what gave a true image of Jahiliya? Yeah, what gave you have to understand when a poet, for example, let's take music, today's music. If we take today's music and we look at each music, the lyrics, and we try and draw an image of let's say for example American rappers. You take American rappers, does that American rappers, the lyrics, does that depict the image of what let's say the life in America is like? Or African Americans, that's what they're going through. Or let's say take country music and we say, okay, country music, this is the lifestyle that they have. Or we take Bollywood music and we say this is the kind of lifestyle that they have in India. Yeah. No, it's obviously not. So some poets definitely used to exaggerate certain concepts and ideas in their community for different purposes. Yeah, so so that's one thing to understand. The poet's idea is not to draw an image of the entire from A to Z of his society. Sometimes he's going to deliberately embellish certain things just so that he can, you know, stir up uh, anger and hatred in his community for other people. So that's one thing. The other thing is the Quran itself draws a beautiful picture of what Arabs are like. Yeah. And we believe the Quran is from Allah. It is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one can compete with the Quran. And the Quran, the way it depicts uh, the Arabs at that time, for example, like the Quran talks about their religious beliefs, like I told you, yeah. So some of them they used to do Hajj, some of them used to believe in angels, some of them never used to believe in angels. Some of them, yeah, the Arabs and their boasting that we talked about the 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 proud the pride that they used to have in their tribes and the racism that they had. The Quran talks about that. They them sticking to their forefathers. The Quran talks time and time again about how they're not willing to change their ways. Uh, 
that you know the Prophet وسلم, being living amongst them, living inside of Mecca and knowing all of what's happening, and them still after all of that knowing who he was, they still don't accept his message. Yeah, that also gives you an idea. So the Quran is not going to paint a picture for you of the entire you know social or or, or, or geographic image of what the Arabs are going through, political situation. It's not going to do that. It's going to give you little snippets. Whatever's important for our guidance, the Quran is going to tell us. The Quran is not going to tell us. It's like a history book, which is going to draw for us everything that happened. So that's very important to understand. And the other thing is this, is that number two, so different, uh, uh, so why is there difference in poetry? So there should be differences in poetry, like, like we said before, that poetry in Jahiliya, because we have poems all around the Arabian Peninsula, there was the same language that they had, they shared the same language, even though they spoke different dialects, they generally understood each other. So this is why that these poets would have when they used to come to Mecca and they used to interact with each other. What language did they used to interact in? So if you're having you know, a festival every single year in Jahiliya where people are coming from all around, they obviously their language is going to be affected and the people in Mecca, their language is going to be affected the most. The Quraysh, more specifically. Yeah. So this is why you have poets, you have Arabic language where you know they... Some of the tribes, like the Quraysh, they say um, Al, yeah, the Quraysh, they use the Al at the beginning of words, Al Kitab, whereas there were some tribes who actually used to say Am, Am Kitab, instead of Al, they used to have Am, yeah. so Al and Am, they used to have that. So they, we do know, and it's preserved in our books, that the Arabs used to have different, so this is reflected in some of their poetry as well. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of the poetry that we have hasn't reached us because, remember, we are focusing on Quraysh. The Quran was revealed amongst the people of Quraysh. And so the dialect that the Prophet ﷺ said, his dialect, the Quran's dialect, is revealed in the dialect of Quraysh. And that's why other dialects now began to die out. So people were at that time focusing a lot on the preserved poetry, which is of that dialect. Okay. Meters, again, the same thing with the meters as well. That can be said. Okay. Strong chain. Yes, there are certain chains which are weak. Without a doubt, but they are also strong chains. And like I told you before, we don't deal with chains of poetry like we deal with hadith. Hadith were very strict. Yeah, and any of you guys who have studied Usul Hadith would know that Usul Hadith criteria and strictness is something that's unparalleled in our whole of our tradition. Yeah, we are not as strict in history, historic, in seerah, in the life of the Prophet, in poetry in these kind of things, like we are strict in hadith. So that's why we can't compare the chains. And there's supporting things that, that support this poem being attributed to a certain person as well. Like for example, the language of the poem as well. And the people who narrate this poem as well. Yeah, so let's say there's a poet who is from a particular tribe. And that tribe, all of them generally know this poem. So, you know, we can happily say that this poem was most likely said by this poet. And if you study Arabic poetry in great detail, you will know that there are differences of opinions in attributing poetry. For example, like, you know, on Facebook, people put a poem and they'll write underneath it, oh, this was said by Imam Shafi. In fact, a lot of the poems that are attributed to Imam Shafi are not Imam Shafi's own poems. Some of them were said by other people, but because they wanted to make their poems more acceptable in the community, what they would do is they would add at the end, they would say, oh, Imam Shafi said this. Yeah, they just add that. So unfortunately, a lot of the poems of Ali radiallahu anhu as well, we have Ali radiallahu anhu, yeah, a lot of the poems that are attributed to him as well, have falsely been attributed to him. And unfortunately, you know, this is something which um, uh, the scholars of Kufa, Ibn, Ibn Salam, Abu Ubaidah Ibn Salam, he actually mentions this in a book called Shi'r wa Shu'ara. He says a lot of the poems that are attributed to Ali were falsely attributed to him because people wanted to, for political reasons or for their own, you know, sectarian reasons, wanted to support or wanted to say something against him. Yeah, so and th that's something as well. Okay, most poetry is invented. Now, you can't say most poetry is invented. Yeah, that's obviously to claim most poetry is invented. You need to have 
you know, a very thorough research of all Arabic poetry. Yeah, and to say that kind of statement, that's not really something that a layman can say. You need to be very an expert. And the Ima a Sheikh Mahmoud Shakir, Mahmoud Shakir, Ahmed Shakir, Mahmoud Muhammad Shakir, he has a book known as Masadir Shi'r al Jahili. And he goes into a great detail yeah, to refute this Masadir Shi'r al Jahili. And Mahmoud Shakir was actually a student of Taha Hussein. And he talks about how Taha Hussein would, uh, uh, you know, deliberately ignore Mahmoud Shakir's questions that he had against him. So Mahmoud Shakir has written this in great detail in the introduction of his book called Mutanabbi. So he's got a book called Al Mutanabbi. It's about the famous poet Mutanabbi. And in the intro, read the intro. And in there, he talks about his conversations and his correspondence with his teacher, okay, Mahmoud Shakir, with his teacher Taha Hussein. And how Taha Hussein would deliberately ignore him and wasn't able to answer a lot of his questions. Okay, so, uh, and then claiming that they were invented by the, yes, the Banu Umayyah did invent certain things. The Banu Umayyah even invented hadith. Some of the hadith that we have, yeah, Banu Umayyah would invent them just to support their political agendas. Some of them would, not all of them, some of the, some of the people would. But Alhamdulillah, the scholars of hadith were very shrewd, very critical. And they were able to sieve through the hadith and and falsify them. Okay, Mufassirin Muhaddithin invented poetry. Again, you know that's, that's absurd. That is, yeah, to say that Mufassir and a Muhaddith. Yes, sometimes Muhaddith and Mufassir they make may may make mistakes in quoting poetry. They may even mention a poem which has in reality is is a made up poem and unknowingly they quote it. And, but remember the Mufassir and the Muhaddith. They don't use the poetry as a main source of proving their points. Yeah, they just use it as supporting evidence. That's all it is. Okay. And false image of Arabian society, this last point. So claiming that Islam or claiming that the Quran or the Arabs, they didn't used to live their lives like this. And it's true. And this is inshallah why I am um or one of the reasons why i'm working at the moment on compiling a course on jahiliya so i want to cover all aspects as much as i can of jahiliya what kind of jobs they used to have in jahiliya how they used to run their cities what kind of vehicles or transport they used to use what kind of food they used different tribes used to eat what kind of clothing the women used to wear what kind of clothing the men used to wear what kind of hairstyles they used to have what kind of um you know, um, uh, weddings they used to have, their ceremonies, their rituals, beliefs that they used to have, swords they used to carry, bows and arrows and weapons and, and, and footwear, and all these things, inshallah, I'm going to try and collect all of them as I can to build a picture of what Arabs, and I truly believe Arab society was a very rich society. Yes, very rich. However, it does not go against what the Quran says. Yeah, whatever the Quran says, this is absolutely true. Yeah, because we believe as Muslims that the Quran is the word of Allah and Allah he only mentions to us in the Quran those aspects of their lives which were which needed rectification yeah, Allah points out the mistakes so that they could rectify themselves and Allah not mentioning other aspects of their life that's fine that's there's there's some there's a reason for that maybe there's no significance in our guidance for that okay and you know then saying that Ibrahim alayhi salam he was a fictional character or even like some claim that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was a fictional character that the Arabs invented just to support their political agenda because uh, the Arabs were on the verge of an uprise at that time and all they needed was they needed a fictional character who was like truthful, known to be truthful and known to be uh, trustworthy and so they invented this you know character known as Muhammad Na'udhu Billah, may Allah save us from that this is something, the kind of things that people like this say so we, 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 we shun all of that, reject all of that. And we say, no, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a person. He was existing in that society. There are too many evidences to prove otherwise. Yeah, it's just silly for someone to, to reject that. And that Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam was there. Ismail Alayhi Salaam, they existed. Yes, the Arabs, the Arabs Al-Adnaniyin. Yeah, in some of the things that, the things that kind of he says, if you read Shaykh Al-Jahili, you'll be surprised at what he says about, you know, the Ibrahim Alayhi He actually claims that 
the Jews influenced a lot of of uh, pre-Islamic things. No, I don't. Uh, no, he doesn't say that Muhammad is a fictional character. What I'm saying is, a lot of people have taken this kind of idea to assume that you know, well, if the Quran talks about a person called Muhammad, then you know maybe there's a um, possibility that he didn't exist. He was just like one of those you know Greek myth you know mythology um, concepts. So he doesn't. I, I haven't found anything that he clearly says it, but there are some commentators or, or critics of his book who say he alludes to something towards that. Okay, so so this idea that the Arab society, he actually says that like I said that the Jews were very influential in the Arab society and they were the ones that wanted to bring their own lineage into the Arab society. So they claim that Ibrahim salam and Ismail salam were the fathers of the Arabs and hence that the Jews have some sort of footing in the Arabian Peninsula. That's one of the things that he was indicating towards as well. Yeah, and and that you know, th th in reality, it wasn't. And he says that you know, um, because why he says why don't the Arabs call their children Ibrahim? Why don't the uh, cho Arabs call their children Ismail? You, you won't find any Sahabi or children or fathers of the Sahaba who call themselves Ibrahim or call themselves Ismail if they were. The lineage, if their lineage went back to Ibrahim and Ismail, wouldn't they be proud of that? So this is the kind of things that he comes, comes out with. So the answer to this, uh, Wajdi Farid, Wajdi Farid has a book um, on criticizing his uh, his work. And he says something, something very interesting. He says that, look, the Arabs, if they affiliated themselves to Ibrahim, salam, okay, and they held on to his teachings don't you think they would have held on to the teaching of the oneness of Allah just like the Jews claim monotheism and the Christians claim monotheism don't you think the Arabs would have held fast to their claim they don't but you see this other things that Ibrahim salam had in his in his life which was Hajj yeah, and which was um, you know the practice of serving the pilgrims and all of that you find them in the Arabs society so even through the literature of hadith, we find that inside the Kaaba, they had drawn an image of Ibrahim salam and Ismail salam holding the divine arrows. And the Prophet wasallam said that, uh, you know, this is something that they've made up. This is something that the Arabs, the, the, the Quraysh have invented and he destroyed it. Yeah, that's true. That is that, that's something that, that happened in hadith. So yes, they, because they were very cultural people, they took what they wanted from the life of Ibrahim and Ismail salam, and they left what they didn't want okay so so that's some of the the things that I mean if you want to read more you can read more in um, in the books that I mentioned like the introduction of Mutanabbi al-Masadir al-Shi'r al-Jahili and also a book by uh, Farid al-Wajdi uh, which is known as um, uh, Naqd Kitab al-Shi'r al-Jahili Naqd Kitab al-Shi'r al-Jahili yeah, and also Mustafa Rafi writes extensively about this. He's got lots of books. Mustafa Rafi, Rafi. So he's got extensive work that he's done on this, and he's dedicated certain works just to 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 establish these points and to to expose you know Taha Hussein's mistakes that he's made. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, I mean our tradition is strong, and uh, the Quran is obviously our main source of our guidance. For advanced students, like I said, this is very important to understand. Any questions, guys? Yeah. So this is probably certain some things which are new to you guys. You probably guys didn't know about this. But if you're like studying advanced Arabic, you know, and you're into all of these academic discussions, then it's important to know what people have said. Uh, and to my knowledge, no, he didn't. Yeah, Wallah Alam, Allah knows best. But according to what I've read and according to what I've uh, studied and no, he he didn't. Yeah. And you know the th thing is, a lot of Taha Hussein's ideas have spread in Egypt and certain Arabian Arabian countries, and it has caused a lot of um, kind of dissension amongst amongst Muslims, unfortunately. So it sounds, you see, when when something is novel, it sounds very nice and it sounds it like it makes sense as well, especially if it's based on you know a, a post Renaissance uh, philosophy. Yeah, the way we, you know, we need to uh, re-investigate all of our tradition all again. We need to 
break it all down. We need to look at it in a different way now. We need to look at it in the light of of Descartes or in the light of um, you know Michel Foucault or, or in the light of other other philo- 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 philosophers. Yeah, and and unfortunately that that isn't you know because if you say that today, then in a hundred two hundred years time, when another philosopher pops up, and then we're going to revise the whole of our, our deen again. So that doesn't make sense. That doesn't. That's that's just you know changing your 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 beliefs according to your desires. So we don't do that. We believe the Quran is preserved. Alhamdulillah, Allah has promised in the Quran that He's going to preserve the Quran, and part of that preservation is that Allah preserved its meanings as well. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Yeah, Allah. Allah Akbar. Uh, yes, yes. So there, there's there's books, there's books that are written on like stories that were passed down. Yeah, stories that were passed down. Yeah, Hatim Ta'i and others as well of um uh, Imr um, al-Qais stories about him. There's stories about um. Umayya ibn Abi Salt, there's stories about um, uh, Al-Mu'idi. So you can get this, 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 uh, the, like the, the books that I sent you guys. Um, you know, Khizanat al-Adab, and these, they're filled with these. Yeah, they're filled with these things. Some of the stories are made up, yes. Some of the stories are false. But a lot of the stories in there, they, they have, because our tradition was preserving chains as well. So they have chains that go back to them. And because it kind of, corroborates what the Quran says and what other po- po- poems say, then, you know, it, it, it does have some truth to it. Are there any courses specifically? You know, I, I don't think there's any courses. I don't I don't think there's a need for courses for that. What there is a need for is, um, you know, people to highlight, because obviously there's going to be too many stories to, to cover. So there, there's a need for highlighting these things and reading. So if you read, I mean, I think maybe, I don't know what level you, you see yourself at, I think start reading these books and slowly go through them and you'll become more and more exposed to 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 this. And inshallah, the course that I'm doing, there's a book called uh, uh, Tariq al Tariq al Mawsu'a to Tariq al al Jahili. Mawsu'a Tariq by Ali Jawad. Mawsu'a to Tariq al Jahili Qabl al Islam. That's a 10 volume book. I think it's, you can get a 6 volume now. Yeah, that kind of covers in great detail. You can also read books on dictionaries as well, like you know, Imam Ibn Siddhas. The great thing about the, the, the Muslim dictionaries is that the dictionary is not a dry book. It has so much in there. Yeah, like I said, it's like an essay on each word. They write like essays on each word. And you can see so much like just with one word, there's a whole story behind one word. Or there's a whole story behind a, a proverb. Yeah, anything else, guys? No. So I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Alhamdulillah, um, and hopefully in the future make dua guys, I get that Jahili course then, and inshallah I'll be delivering that. So sometime next year, at the moment I've got three or four courses I've planned, so I'm busy and, and preparing for those, but hopefully next year, maybe springtime, I'm trying to, I'm trying springtime, but if not then summertime, inshallah. Jazakallah khair guys, um, may Allah keep you guys happy, and see you guys in the future sometime. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much guys for watching this video and again thank you to all my patrons as well for all your support Jazakumullah khair may Allah reward you immensely if you guys want to become a patron then links in the description below Jazakumullah khair Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh